right. Yes. Oh, that mic is off. I know. How's everyone? <laughs> Welcome, everybody. If you're here today, you're probably interested in how to create a winning product management and engineering relationship. Well, you've come to the right place because Eric and I have both lived through this. And we're going to leave you with a few takeaways that hopefully you can apply back at your own companies. Let me get the clicker. There we go. So what's going on with your teams? Are your product management and engineering teams arguing? Are they not working together effectively? Maybe product management and engineering have two completely different roadmaps. Or maybe product management is giving engineering a long list of features and products to deliver, and they're not listening to engineering ideas. Whatever it is, this kind of relationship doesn't win in the game that we're going to talk about today. So we're going to be talking about a game of delivering great products. My name is Ann Hunt, and I've been working in technology for almost 25 years. I started in hands-on development of early artificial intelligence systems in Silicon Valley, and did that for the first half of my career. And then about 12 years ago, I moved into product management. So I've been on both sides of the table. And I'm Eric Peterson. I'm the CTO and founder of Cloud Zero. And, and like Ann, I've been in this game for about 25 years as well. Actually started on the product management side before coming to my one true love, the engineering aspect of this. How do we build things? And uh, when Ann and I connected, we really understood that we had both been on both sides of this coin from so many different perspectives and observed that we kind of wanted to refactor this relationship. So let's talk a little bit about the game that we're going to be uh, playing today and how we're going to uh, move through this. Absolutely. So getting into character a little mm. bit here. My name is Ann, and I'm a product manager. And I'm Eric. I'm going to be the engineer. And we have a confession to make. Uh, we, we didn't always get along, actually, right? Yeah. In fact, we had to collaborate on this talk, and, you know, it got rough sometimes. It was a learning experience. <laughs> For anybody who's been a product manager or an engineer, you've probably felt a little tension on either side of that, uh, uh, across that desk. So we want to really talk about that tension head on today. OK, great. So let's talk about this game a little bit. So in this game, what you're trying to do is to deliver a product that serves the customer and the business. We like to start with the customer side, absolutely. So how do you create value for customers? In the book, Escaping the Build Trap by Melissa Perry, she said the job of a product manager is to create value. It's important if that value is delivered to customers, solving their needs, pain points, and desires, and then they love the product, and so they pay the business. And that delivers value to the business as well. And so when that happens, you're in what we call the sweet spot. I think there's something missing from this sweet spot, Anne, because uh, I don't know about you, but isn't the product the most important part of this conversation? How could we actually have a sweet spot if we haven't um, actually added the part that we're here to build together? Ah, right? Possibly, possibly. Like, I don't think that product's going to be building itself. That's where engineering comes in, right? We're the ones who are ultimately going to solve this problem, right? So? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well. I grant you, technology has changed. Mm. And even though this is an old game, and it was one that people were playing 100 years ago or farther, whenever you had a business, you were trying to deliver value to the customer and value to the business. And yes, you had to create a product. I grant you that the product and technology have actually changed the scale and scope of the game. Yeah, it definitely has. And we've got some new constraints, too, that we have to think about when we talk about this game, right? How much stuff do we have to learn these days? And how all of these decisions we're making affect the business ultimately, right? But let's talk a little bit about where we started before we got into this game. Absolutely. So one big advance that I think everybody knows about is the agile transformation. So back in the 90s, product management would spend you know, time writing a really long document with all the specifications. They would hand that document over to engineering. Engineering would spend six months to a year or possibly longer, developing the product. The product would go out to the customer. And only then would you find out if, hey, this is actually going to be successful and the customer is going to love it or not. That has definitely changed. So technology and everything we do today makes it possible to deliver products 
many times, even many times every week or many times a day. And a lot of companies are doing that, and that's great. So what that transformation is, is the transformation to building fast and delivering fast. So Teresa Torres wrote a book called Continuous Discovery Habits, and in that she pointed out that we used to build, measure, and learn, but now what we need to do is actually learn first and then build and measure. And the reason that's important is because if you build first, you're often building things that the customers don't want, and then you have to get rid of those, and that's wasting time, causing you to be slower and maybe not win this game after all. And I really think about, you know, when we think about the good old days of where we came from, that big monolithic document that we all went off and built, to the world now that we live in where we might be releasing two or three or four, or, I don't know, a dozen times a day, we've rushed out to embrace all these new kind of cloud-driven processes, DevOps, continuous integration, continuous deployment, but, you know, you'll notice here on the chart, right, what is the actual process for product engineering to work together in this world where things are iterating so fast, right? If you're building new features or functions, you're releasing that based on the data that you're getting, it's not enough to go back to the drawing board and write up a big requirements document or anything of that kind of nature. You have to actually think in the moment and then have the right framework in place in order to make those decisions. And I think a lot of companies are making those decisions today, but we haven't really talked about what that process is between product and engineering. Right, so just to summarize a few of the points that we've touched on so far. far. So first off, technology is really, it has changed things. The game is, has changed because technology is so different. And I can no longer, you know, wait until something is delivered, learn something, go back with my product management team, think it through, write up a few things, and then come back to engineering. I have to talk to my engineers all the time because they're gonna know what technology is gonna make possible for our customers, and that's really, really critical. So that brings us to collaboration over communication. So it's, it's not just having a good communicative relationship, it's actually working together to ideate on behalf of the customers. Finally, today, creating a product is more about an imaginative composition of things that may already exist. You're not just building from scratch. Again, if you start from scratch, you're often gonna be too slow. So it gets back to that idea of being able to learn before you've actually built anything, and then to put things out quickly so that you're learning faster and iterating. Yeah, the pace has really changed. And the engineering game has changed along with it as well, right? Us engineers, we have to understand actually what's on the minds of our customers, their motivations. We can't just wait for someone to bring the requirements to us or the ideas to us, but we need to develop a deep relationship with them as well. And that means learning how to communicate with them and have an environment that allows us to do that, right? And I like to think that the lack of knowledge these days is actually one of the most dangerous sources of technical debt. Right? When we all came out here to reinvent, there might have been, I don't know, 250 AWS services. When we go back home, there might be 300, right? And we're probably still trying to figure out what to do with the ones that we learned about last year, right? So this process of learning has to become part of our process, and, and we have to make time for it, most of all. And then, last but not least, in this cloud-driven world that we live in, Every engineering decision now is a buying decision. When you write a line of code or make an architecture decision or you decide to use this service over that service, you're actually making a long, you know, kind of long impact, uh, impactful decision that could either make your business profitable or not profitable. And in today's climate, that's actually something really important to think about, right? It can be very expensive when you, uh, when you write that line of code. I might be spending $10 or I might be spending $10,000 and that decision will stick with the product for a long time. So, what's at stake? Yes, absolutely. So, if you don't hit the sweet spot, your business is, is not gonna succeed. I mean, we all know that most startups don't make it. And the ones that do make it and start to scale, get traction, maybe experience hyperscale, what you may not know is a lot of times companies fail to continue to scale. It's, they might do it once, but it's a little bit trickier to keep doing it over and over and continue to scale and grow faster and faster. So 
What happens in a situation like this is that people are fearful. They know that it's possible that their company won't make it. And sometimes fear leads to tyranny. One, one group or another will try to take over. I've been in companies where product management has said, be quiet, engineering. We've got it covered. We're going to just give you a list of things to d deliver. And then you're not getting the benefit of that engineering creativity and understanding of the technical possibilities. I've been in companies where the CEO gives a long list of features to deliver and says, look, we're driving towards revenue. We've got to get it done doesn't listen to product or engineering. And also, unfortunately, where engineering sometimes takes over and says, this is an awesome technology. Let's do it. Deliver it to market, and customers don't like it. All these people could just get out of our way, and engineering could just build. Yes. We would solve the yeah, problem, I right? Think maybe. No, well, we knew <laughs> that the thing that was missing on that other screen was the sweet spot, right? You know, when you're not aligned and you haven't figured out how to make sure that you're aligned around the goals and objectives, then you have a big problem, right? You know, the ultimate goal here for everything that we're working on is that we have this shared mental model because we are collaborating, not necessarily having time to always communicate. And if we have that shared mental uh, model about how we are going about creating value to our business, right? That's why we're in this, in this game in the first place is to build something of value and delight our customers, right? Then we have alignment and we can move fast, right? And then we're building it together. Right, and if we're not uh, doing that, then it's like we're trying to dance to two different songs. It's not gonna work. Oh, it's not gonna work for me. I'm not a very good dancer <laughs> at all, but well. we can try it. <laughs> you can see. Okay, so what needs, so getting back to this idea of refactoring, when you refactor a software system, you're often throwing away things you don't need anymore so you can be more agile and make room for new things. It's the same thing with a relationship. We've got to get rid of some of the old baggage that we carry in our heads so that we can make room for this new mental model of how product management and engineering can work together. One of the things I hear all the time, just repeated endlessly, is that product owns the what and the why and engineering owns the how and the when. How many people have heard that before in this business? Right? Yes, yeah. a lot. It's a lot and of it, I have to admit, it sounds wonderful, and it gives you that sense of, okay, I know what's going on. The problem is that it's so neat and tidy, and it doesn't get to that collaborative aspect. In the real world, it actually doesn't work. You know, I'm, I'm guilty of saying that a few times in the past as well, you know, trying to create some sort of sense of control in, in the environment and between the relationship between product and engineering. If we can just focus on our thing and they leave us alone, then we can solve the problem. But the reality is that's actually creating the problem, right? We don't have a good shared mental model of what, what we're trying to build. And then when it comes time to actually be in this rapid DevOps continuous deployment phase, well, the wrong thing gets built, right? And we have actually a new, more modern version of what tyranny happened when we had the big monolithic requirements document in 18 month cycles. Now we have decisions being made without good context. And most importantly, an idea of what's gonna delight the customer. Right. So it's time for a little fall cleaning, but why don't we tell a few stories of <laughs> where this has gone wrong in the past, maybe to connect, connect things. Absolutely. So in 1999, I lived in Mountain View, California, and I was standing in my apartment. Those were really the good old days in 1999. Yes, 1999. I was watching a delivery driver from a dot-com called Webvan, and he was delivering groceries, bananas, apples, you know, bread, everything getting delivered into my kitchen, and I had never seen those groceries before. At that time, that was amazing. I had ordered them online, and now they were being delivered. And I was so excited about that, and uh, so was he. And we were joking about how Webvan couldn't fail, and he was gonna be rich in five years, and probably buy his own private island. That's what we thought happened with startups back then, all of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so lots of excitement. Uh, Webvan was founded in 1996 with $400 million in funding, which was a lot. And then it went public a few years later for another 400 million for a total of $800 million in the bank. And they were expanding rapidly and they had a really, really big vision. Their vision was that consumers would be able to order anything they wanted online and have it delivered to their home. That's a crazy idea. I yeah. Is anybody yeah. doing that today? I don't know. Good idea, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But uh, yeah, so they couldn't fail. They just absolutely couldn't fail until a couple years later, they did. They went out of business, shut their doors, and they were gone. So what happened there? Well, some people said that the founders didn't know enough about delivering groceries. And some people said that, you know, they didn't iterate enough. Uh, I think there's probably a germ of truth to all of the theories. But the way I would sum it up is that the business was driving to a vision and they weren't listening to the customers, the market, or the product management team. Mm -hmm. You're saying the product management team had it all figured out? Maybe they know, did. You know, I had an order with Webvan back then. I'm still waiting for it to arrive, actually. I think it got <laughs> stuck in the tubes somewhere along the way. Um, I think on the other side, though, there's equal examples of where engineering had it figured out and product might have uh, you know, spent a little time listening to us. We would have been able to figure it out. So if I could share a story of my own. Not too long ago, I was at a company where we were trying to build, bring an on-premise product to the world of SaaS. Right? Now, today, most of us think or start with SaaS, but there wasn't not too long ago a point where it was like, well, wait, how are we going to solve this world and build something that anybody on the internet can come and access? And of course, product was super crazy about this new business model and how it was going to change the world. But us engineers were a little skeptical. And the thought was, just quickly go and deploy it, one at a time for each customer as they sign up. We were terrified of this idea. Nowadays, we spend time thinking about multi-tenancy and how it's going to scale and how we're going to serve all these customers and what happens when we need to actually maintain it over the long haul, all the operational aspects of that. But product was having none of it. And we went out the gate building this thing as quick as we could and just decided to real-time provision it in our data center. Of course, this is pre -date. We, we weren't even operating this in a true elastic cloud. And you can imagine what happened, right? Product hadn't figured out the business model and aligned SaaS with on-premise. The technology wasn't, was half-baked. We had never figured out how to deploy this thing, and it was a total failure, right? We even had the whole company basically conclude that this whole SaaS thing was a fad, and that whole <laughs> part of the business is gone. They don't exist anymore, right? You know, those are the things. And you know what, I can't help but think back, Anne, that if we had just listened to engineering, maybe we would have figured it out, because it was a technology problem. So, I don't know. Technology. As much as I like product, I, you know, there's a reason I went to the engineering side. I, <laughs> you know. So, I say, why don't you refactor this process by taking engineering side and maybe letting us lead the way? Well, I don't know about that. I want to lead my team to understand the customer and find solutions uh. in the sweet spot. This is the tension that we talked about. This was the hard part of this mm -hmm. conversation, right? Who leads the way when it comes to this? And it's very stressful for all of us. When yes. we're thinking about engineering and product working together and mm -hmm. getting back to this, this old idea of the what and the why and the how and the when and who gets to talk to customers and who brings the requirements over and carrying around the red stapler, it, it gets very stressful. I mean, the problem with engineering is all you ever talk about is technology. Oh, it's the Customers thing ever. do not want technology. Oh, they want solutions. I don't know. You should talk to my wife. I think I have a gadget problem at home, but it has yes, solved so many problems. <laughs> I can turn off the lights by entering into the room. It's oh, fantastic. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> fantastic. All right. This is getting a little tense. All right. Maybe we need to take a break. Yeah. Um, this makes me feel so much better when I, I stare at this. I hope it does. I know. I hope it does. Is there, is there some statistics behind this, this photo? In fact, there is data behind mm. this. Mm. Uh, did you know that science has shown that if you look at pictures of cute animals like this puppy, mm. you will actually slow down and be more careful with complicated tasks? And I think we need to be careful here. I, I admit we probably need engineering. We can't get rid of you entirely. Maybe the process <laughs> is to give everyone a puppy, right? Uh, Everybody's bringing that. back a lot of t-shirts, but has anybody brought back a puppy from reInvent? I don't know. There this could be the secret. We might be onto something here, Anne. This yes. could be the secret to refactoring this relationship. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I feel better. I think we can start talking about what might solve this problem. Yes, let's move forward. Mm. I have to admit that I love understanding the customer and the business and the competition. Mm. Maybe I could also learn a little bit about the technology. Mm. And I could probably spend a little time understanding if uh, we really do need a light switch that can activate with my voice or you know, what mm -hmm. the customers actually mm -hmm. want. Because at the end of the day, 
if you're not delighting them, if they don't actually show up and want to buy the solution, well, it's not going to be very fun for all of us, particularly if you're a startup, right? Um, at the end of the day, we have to realize that we're here to build something that delights them and that they will pay money for, right? So. All right, so moving forward then. Yeah, so with that, I'd like to, with Anne here, introduce a process that we call product flow, right? It's a different way of thinking about integrating these two responsibilities that we share. And I really want to give credit uh, to uh, Kevin Ulan, who couldn't be here, who helped develop this on my team at Cloud Zero. We built out a, a process that's really focused on cycling through all the activities that in the past we separated and didn't share or didn't communicate on, right? And as you look at this diagram, I want you to think about a couple kind of key things here. This is a loop, right? And it should be aligned with your engineering cycles but pro and product cycles. This should be something that you're doing constantly, over and over. And the time that it takes to go through this process should be quick and repeatable, right? And each loop has a measurable output of business value at the end of this. Now that business value doesn't have to be a product or a feature, it can be something that you've learned or some idea that you, or hypothesis that you wanted to validate. And that learning part of this is actually one of the most important parts of this process. Over 60% of this process is really focused on what we would call learning, right? Only 30% is on the building and 10% let's measure. Right? In a lot of ways, this mirrors things like OTA loops, observe, orient, decide, act, but this is a modern process that aligns with the continuous integration and continuous deployment processes that we have. And the only way that this process works is if we share these responsibilities, right? We work together. So you start with research, you think about the hypothesis that you want to test, you do customer discovery, you work your way through validating that, refine your ideas. When you come to execution, your output could be a wireframe. It could be you know, an, a, a screenshot of an idea just so that you can validate it and then get back into this process and iterate. In fact, iteration, we love to talk about this in the industry a lot, but a lot of us pay lip service to iteration. So at its core, that's one of the main focuses of this process. Right, and what I really love about this process is the whole top half of the circle is about learning mm -hmm. and talking to customers. Yeah. This is the flow state for all of us, right? Yeah, Engineers state. love to talk about flow state, but it's not <clears throat> exclusive to them. It should be something that the whole organization gets into sync behind. And we've been looking at this uh, process for quite some time thinking, this is what we've been doing, but we haven't given it a name or really given it a, a, a view into, in, into how we can share this with other folks. So let's talk about some things that all of you can do when you get back home and start thinking about how you might apply this or might be looking at the, the tasks that you're already doing and fitting them into this framework, right? We wanna give you a couple of key takeaways that hopefully can make this very real for all of you. Yeah. The number one thing that I would actually suggest is talking to customers regularly. So you, might be surprised, I talk to a lot of product managers, I talk to a lot of engineering teams in different company, many different companies, and you might be surprised to find that it, not all product management teams talk directly to customers, and certainly not on a regular basis. Often this, in a larger company, can be offloaded to another team, a research team, who talks to customers, boils up the information, gives it to you in PowerPoints or something. Mm. Um, but what's, and what's maybe not as surprising is that it's actually very rare, even if the product management team is talking to customers, for the engineering team to talk to customers as well. And this is where I think uh, you should be really thinking of a breakthrough. If engineering and product are in the same room talking to the customers, or virtual room, they will hear the same thing, and then when you go off to argue about, what did I just hear? What's that opportunity or pain point that I can address? And what's a possible solution for it? You're coming from the same page. You heard the same conversation. And you would perhaps be amazed at how much motivation and excitement and creativity can come out of your entire team if they saw the customer struggling with something. Yeah. Yeah. Talking, to cus oh, well, well, talking to customers doesn't have to be uh, 
you know, difficult or high ceremony. No. Uh, you can actually just have a list of questions, show them a mock-up, perhaps why, let them think out loud while they're using a competitive product. There are a lot of things you can talk to customers about. Yeah, and I want to make it really real, right? When I was in, on the product side in the past, I actually, and I'll admit it, was terrified when the engineers would go, start, go off and start talking to customers. It had me afraid. What were they going to learn? Maybe they were going to come up with some idea that was completely the opposite of what we were trying to build. Or maybe they would get confused about what we were trying to build. Or I envisioned all kinds of nightmare scenarios that would occur. And then a magical thing happened. I moved out of product and into engineering, and I realized we're wandering around lost in the desert. We really don't know how to empathize with our customers. We don't have a connection to them. And it's not that we're trying to have these conversations with customers so that we can go fight with product management, but so that we might actually understand one another finally, right? To understand where these ideas are coming from. And it is truly magical when this happens. So when you think about this practically, it may seem like a very simple idea. Go talk to customers, right? But a lot of us just fail to do it, both on the engineering side and the product side. And don't make it complicated. There should be low touch, low ceremony. In this day and age, we have things like Slack channels and constant communication that should make this easy and simple for all of us. Okay. That's right. Mm. And just to be very clear, you're not looking for the customer to tell you what to build. Mm. You're looking for the understand and empathize, as Eric said, Empathy. with the customer. Yeah. So that when you're solutioning on their behalf, you're on the same page. Yeah. Empathy is probably one of the most powerful forces in building delightful software. Exactly. All right, so that made me feel really good, but now we have some serious, serious stuff to talk about. Uh, this is kind of our serious interlude, which is you know, that there's some other people out there that are paying our salaries, paying for all this cloud computing stuff that we're using. Um, I don't know, I, I mean, I guess we are building products that we want to sell and make money off of too. So the financial aspects of this are very real. And nowadays, they seem even more real, right? So finance would like to remind us all that all of this stuff that we're doing and talking about costs money, right? Now, what does that mean for us in a product and engineering world where we're implementing something like product flow? Well, that means that we have to take on actually new responsibilities that we never thought about before, right? We have to realize that it's on us to turn the lights off when we leave the room, right? If we left all that stuff running in, in our cloud environments when we we're experimenting, we're reducing the likelihood of success for our business, right? We need to think about not just what we're spending our money on, but also how that money is producing value. This is where we get into the unit economics of the systems and solutions that we're building, right? What are my costs, not in terms of my infrastructure? All too often we think about how much I'm spending on EC2 or S3. That's not a very useful metric, but what's super useful is if we think about how we're spending money on products, features, things that we deliver to the market, and then how our costs map to individual customers, because at the end of the day, if we have good margins, then we're building successful companies, we're gonna have efficient growth, and hopefully profitability, right? And that's where we get into forecasting future growth. If I understand what it costs to deliver value and how many you know, units of value I can deliver, well, if I forecast that I'm gonna grow my customer base by 100%, that's actually a better indicator of where my costs are gonna go over time than trying to look in the rearview mirror and understand where it's gonna grow based on what I've spent, right? So there are some resources for all of us to actually think about this. There's a new discipline that has emerged, something called FinOps that a lot of folks have started to uh, come to understand. The FinOps Foundation founded a, a number of years ago in 20, I think it was 2016 actually, now that I think about it, they um, found themselves in a, in a kind of a new world realizing that every engineering decision is a buying decision and that this needs to become part of the product process, right? And these folks can help you, right? They wanna help product teams address these new constraints, right? Think about how we incorporate learning, right? Let's hire folks who have an absolute love of learning because the technology space is constantly changing. Practice something called radical cross transparency. If you send somebody into the restaurant where the menu has no price tags, you know, you get what you expect, right? So we have to make sure everyone understands the costs of those engineering decisions they're making and how those things are interrelated and correlated. 
and then bridge the gap between those serious folks in, in finance and engineering, because at the end of the day, all of this costs money. What I think is super, super empowering to all of us here is that product and engineering, we actually have a bigger impact than perhaps even the sales or marketing parts of our organization in terms of profitability for the companies that we're supporting, right? It's an awesome responsibility. So. And one thing I would say about this that I just love is the fact that you're doing it continuously. Yeah. And it's not a big bang. So just like continuous refactoring, you're mm -hmm. sort of continuously looking at this, if, if I understand it. Every sprint, every plan, yeah. you're thinking about the cost. Yeah. Don't go in and turn off all the lights in the house. You do have to serve your customers a little bit, right? But there are ways to incrementally get at this. So I want everyone to repeat after me in their minds at least, you know, Prioritize efficient growth over just growth at any cost, right? All right. All right, so we have summed this up in a checklist. Checklists have been shown to be really awesome uh, at helping you boil down complicated procedures and systems into a few things that, so that you can identify places where you could perhaps improve or where, the, where you're doing well or not so well. And it's so metrics driven, I love it. <laughs> So the way I'm going to do this is I'm actually going to quiz you, Eric, about Cloud Zero on the, on the spot. Fly. Yeah. Yes. I mean, if only we had practiced this, I know you would have been asking me that. <laughs> I don't know. I'm a little nervous, I though. Sprung the slide on it. I know. I'm a little Last nervous. Minute. All right. Hit so while I'm doing this, think about your own company at home and be giving yourself a score, and uh, and then you know you'll sort of know how you're doing or where where things yeah. are going well or not. As we go through this process, we're going to ask you at the end of this how you think you lined up on this uh, on this scorecard as well. That's right. So first, mm. Eric, at Cloud Zero, can everyone speak directly to customers? So I was having a conversation th this morning actually about this, and and it was like kind of a reality check to me because I realized we do something that is pretty unusual, like literally everybody in the company in engineering can talk to customers because we have Slack channels now with every customer. And a day doesn't go by that we don't actually have like four or five customer conversations. And it might be one or two sentences. And we've gotten so used to this that it's really just become second, you know, kind of second hat to us. But as I was talking to other uh, engineering leaders, they're like, you do what? Are you crazy? That doesn't happen here. We wait for these big customer you know, uh, advisory board meetings and all this ceremony and all this stuff. And um, you know, it was a reality check for me. So obviously, I'm going to score myself pretty highly on this one. I think I'm going to go with two points for this one. But I understand if this is something that not everyone is ready to do or is doing. But it has been very empowering. Um, so two points. All right, two. Mm. And do these conversations with both product managers and engineers and others mm. and the customers happen regularly? Yeah, I guess I, guess I kind of uh, tip my hat on that one. It happens so regularly that it's, it's, it, we don't even uh, keep track of it anymore. It just, it's just constant. It's almost like part of our flow for our product and, and engineering processes. So these conversations, well, they're probably happening right now while, while I'm up here. So. Another two points, I'm feeling. Okay, so you've got perfect. four. Now we're gonna get to a hard one. Mm. So if I went up to an engineer on your team, and I know there's some here at reInvent so I can do this, <laughs> and I ask them what is their understanding of what they're trying to accomplish on behalf of the business and the customer, mm. and then I went and asked the same question separately to a product manager on the same team, would they say the same thing? I'm a little embarrassed. So alignment is one of the hardest things uh, most companies struggle with. And uh, it's true that that, that kind of um, alignment where everyone really truly has the same shared uh, vision and objective, yeah, we can struggle with that a little bit. Um, I would like to give myself, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go with one point on this one. You know, maybe, uh, maybe I'm being generous, but we do like talking with folks and. It, Thankfully, our customers do align us, but we could do a better job. We could definitely do a better job. Okay. All right, I think I'm up to five. Right. Yes, it looks like it. So, in terms of culture, mm. do your teams commit to a decision, and then once they've done that and they've learned, do they go back and change what they did, mm. 
or do they get stuck in an endless loop of argument or perhaps put things out there that they never remove or get rid of? Mm. I mean, how many people have heard of that saying, disagree and commit, right? You know, that's, um, you know, sometimes it's attributed to some, somebody important at Amazon, but I think Andy Grove actually had a, had a, had a part to play in, in coming up with that. But this idea of disagree and commit, right? That you're all gonna get together, you're gonna kind of like disagree about stuff, hash it out, but then you're gonna commit. Now, the problem with that statement to me always was that uh, the disagreement part, it just sounded so negative, right? Um, so I wanted to tie it into something that we should all be doing and thinking a little bit deeper about, which is how do we commit and then iterate, right? We've all built an MVP. We've all designed products and ideas and got them quickly out the market. But how many times have we turned around and come back to that thing that we built and then continue to work on it, right? Yeah, uh, you it's know, important to get rid of that baggage so that yeah. you stay agile. I mean, I think software is never really finished. It's only kind of like art. It's abandoned at some point, right? And so we have to continuously to continue to iterate on it. So building a culture of commit and iterate frees up the teams to be, you know, one, feel secure that they can make decisions but not feel locked into them, and then come back and start again or rethink where they were. So, your so score. anyways, this is a long way of me getting to the score. I know that we could do a better job iterating. I think we get a good job committing, but sometimes we get busy and we forget to come back, and we're still working on that one. So I'm going to give us a one on that one. Okay. All right, so finally, and this one is probably a, a slam dunk for you folks at, at Cloud Zero, I think, but are your teams adopting FinOps? We have radical cost transparency out the wazoo. Everybody knows down to the penny what, what they're, they're spending. An engineer making a change has an instant um, kind of notification as to how much that change is affecting the, the overall profitability of our products. So yeah, that's a short answer on that one. We get a perfect two, I think. Okay, so. Where do we end up? Oh. Ta-da. <laughs> it looks like it. Eight. eight. Oh, geez, who knew? It's in the green. It's All in right. the green. So how many people out there think that your current team is in the green, eight or above, seven or above? No one. <laughs> okay. So I think we have a lot of honest people. So, in the or room maybe today. people just don't want to raise their hand, but how many people at least identified a couple of things you think you can improve on when you go back to your companies? Oh, that's awesome. That's what we want to hear. I am Fantastic. so glad to hear that. Yeah. Oh. So, Eric, I just want to say it has been fantastic collaborating with you on oh. this talk. We fighting have, with you about the talk. We have come talk. to grips. The puppy helped a lot. It was very therapeutic. <laughs> yeah, I always have. If everyone would reach under their seat, they'll find a puppy there. No, <laughs> um, no. It, it has been fantastic working with you, and you know we could always say more on this topic. We could always talk about this in depth. This process is evolving. We'd love to continue to evolve it with the folks that, that we get to meet here today. So, I don't know. All right. Awkward high five. Oh. We did it. Woo. Woo. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're gonna leave you with some resources and I wanna start on the, uh, the blog post, Bottlenecks of Scale, scale Ups There, which mm. came out of Martin Fowler's organization, ThoughtWorks, which is, it's, it's an amazing set of content to read uh, one of the things I really love about it is he actually, what the authors there actually do talk about friction between product management and engineering being something that will hold your startup back and some things to do about it. It was very influential on us in this talk. Hmm. Continuous Discovery Habits by Teresa Torres. If you read one book on product management this year, I suggest this one. Not just product managers, engineers, uh, founders, Take a look at this book. It will tell you how to do, how do you take all the information you're learning from your customers, organize it, and use it to drive innovation in all of your teams. It's a really great book. Uh, Escaping the Build Trap is really great if you're starting a company and maybe you're a technical founder, a couple technical founders, and you say, when do we add product management and what do they actually do and how do we make that effective so that our, our business will win? Great book for that. And then the Checklist Manifesto is what inspired us to come up with a checklist for you to use to look at your own companies and decide where you can actually improve. I, I agonize with that decision as a founder myself, thinking about when to add product management, it, right? 
and uh, sometimes you can leave it to the last minute, but it is an important job. I have an appreciation for it, and the puppies helped, of course. Good. Now, I want to encourage everyone also to get involved with the FinOps Foundation. That is a fantastic organization. There's a lot of talks here at reInvent, and you can learn a lot about how incorporating this notion of how every engineering decision is a buying decision into how you think about, from a, both a product and an engineering perspective, how you go about building delightful products. And of course, CloudZero, we'd love to continue the conversation with you as well, me personally. Yeah, so. and here are our contact, and for contact details, Yep. We do want to speak to you. Catch us you know, after the talk, around the conference, or reach out to us online. I would be more than happy to talk to you about your company and talk about product management and engineering and all kinds of different things. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure Eric feels the same way. He oh, would yeah. love to hear from you. I like to think that startups and building companies is a team sport and that we're all in it together. We all have to kind of share our ideas and figure out where we go from here in terms of building new products, how we delight the customer, or how we just change our culture internally and think about incorporating some of those uh, details that we talked about today into your process. And last but not least, we want to come back next year and continue to talk about this process a little bit. So hit that survey and let us know what you thought. Your feedback is very important to us. It's part of our product flow, and we hope all of you will embrace that and help us evolve that as we learn to commit and iterate as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.